Okay, good evening. Good evening to you all in, uh, in Europe. Good afternoon to our friends in uh, the United States. And welcome to our tonight large audience for the eighth transatlantic lecture in a series of 10 lectures uh, where we compare uh, certain policies in the United States and in the European Union. And these lectures have, are organized by the New America Europe Fund at the University of Leuven, KU Leuven. My name is Dirk Wouters. I'm the co-chair of the America Europe Fund. And it's an absolute uh, delight to host the four speakers of tonight uh, uh, on the subject of security and defense. As a reminder, a short reminder, the American Europe Fund was established only recently in October of last year, focusing its mission mainly on this comparatism between the United States and the European Union in the hope to get better insights into each other's policies, strategies, mindset, uh, and so on. So um, in a short time, we have uh, uh, developed an academic platform, a business platform, and as we speak, we're also working on a research platform. So now I would like to introduce our four speakers. Um, and that's really a great honor. Federica Mogherini uh, is a former high representative uh, for foreign and security policy of the European Union and vice president of the European Commission. She has become director of the College of Bruges. We are immensely, immensely proud of that move and we are equally excited that uh, Federica Mogherini has accepted to kick off our session tonight. Uh, she is on top of the list of many, given her commitment to the cause of European and transatlantic security and defense. Second, those familiar uh, with the community of security and defense in Washington will undoubtedly know Jim Townsend, who has for, I think, eight years um, hold key positions in the Pentagon and who was without any doubt the person to go to uh, for the diplomatic corps, uh, the security and defense community, European politicians and think tanks. Um, today you don't have to knock on the door of the Pentagon, you better knock on the door of the Center for New, a new American security where Jim Townsend is still active. Those familiar with the emergence of the European security and defense policy will remember certainly our friend Nick Whitney, not only as the first excellent director of the European Defense Agency, but also, also as a very wise advisor and very fine analyst on all issues concerning security and defense. Nick, you're very welcome. Your skills you're still putting them at good, new, uh, good use today at the European Council of Foreign Relations. And last but not least, in the Brussels world of security and defense, there's a new actor, the European Commission, uh, uh, and a new Directorate General. And I cannot say how thankful we are, extremely thankful to Director Arbo that he has accepted uh, to intervene tonight. Tonight, we are partnering with the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I'm incredibly grateful to Ambassador Bruno Angelet for all his help. He should have been with us tonight, but he was called to a meeting of EU security directors uh, in Lisbon uh, by the Portuguese presidency, where the directors will discuss some, but not all, of the issues we are discussing tonight. So, so far, the introduction. Now, the proceedings for tonight. Are, are, are classical, I would say, traditional. I will launch some larger questions, with starting with strategy, and I will also try during the exchange to encourage uh, interactive uh, debate and comparing EU and the US. You, the audience, you can ask and continue to ask questions on the chat box, and I will pick up as many as I can uh, within our 90 minutes. So here we are, let's try to set the scene. 
And if I can invite Rector Federica Mogherini um, uh, to start. Uh, the Rector, we all know that today, these days, Europe and the United States want to reconfirm uh, trust in the Security Alliance, the transatlantic one. And of course, when you want to reaffirm an alliance, a security alliance, it's always a good thing to have some convergence on strategy, to have some convergence of, or on one's securities outlook to the rest of the world. So could I ask you uh, how you see today the threat perceptions in Europe and how you think Europe should deal with them? And maybe also, if you wish, to give some comments on the ongoing strategic exercises and reflections in Europe, such as the EU strategic compass, or as far as NATO is concerned, the exercise NATO 2030. So that would be my first question. Afterwards, I would invite Jim Tansud uh, with the same questions, an update on the threat perceptions in the United States, the strategic exercises ongoing there, including the Global Posture Review, but also NATO 2030, and uh, how the United States wants to deal today with the uh, perceived threat perceptions in the world. So if that's agreeable to you, uh, Rector Mogherini, we will be uh, delighted to listen to you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this excellent initiative. I'm sorry that I cannot join you in video, but I hope the audio is uh, uh, loud and clear. And uh, uh, it's indeed a pleasure to take part in this evening conversation or this afternoon conversation indeed for uh, across the Atlantic. Um, excellent first question uh, to set the scene. Uh, um, I just uh, finished uh, an hour ago a conversation with Jack Sullivan, uh, National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, together with uh, uh, some friends and colleagues. And uh, um, I can say that definitely uh, the efforts uh, and the intention uh, is there, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic to, um, uh, to reinvigorate uh, the, the community, the partnership, uh, I call it family because I think we are more than partners, we are, we are more than friends, we are family indeed. And uh, um, there is clearly also the symbolism of that, um, the fact that uh, uh, President Biden is, uh, um, is, is uh, coming to Brussels in uh, less than a month from now for the NATO summit and also for the EU-US summit tells a lot about the intentions to highlight and showcase uh, this, this being on the same side of history uh, and being so well connected. Um, and I think that uh, this is the first element to recognize and to applaud, the fact that uh, America is back not only to diplomacy and multilateralism, America is back uh, in, uh, in the transatlantic community with a strong um, intention to, uh, to connect and to coordinate and to work together with uh, Europe, not only with Europe, but with many other partners around the world. Uh, this is the first element uh, that I think reduces the, uh, the, the challenges ahead of us. Then in terms of risk assessment um, and threat assessment, uh, the perception of threats we have uh, in, in Europe and the United States, I think to a large extent, they converge, um, and they are very different from the ones we had uh, uh, even five, six years ago, or even two or three years ago, probably. Because I think that today, both in America and in Europe, uh, the first, um, the first two uh, threats that we all perceive uh, are non-purely military ones. Um, I would guess that if you ask anybody. Uh, from uh, uh, the top leaders uh, to um, uh, anyone in the streets uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, the perception is that uh, uh, the sanitary situation and, and the COVID and the post-COVID situation is the threat number one to our own security, including the impact that this has on, uh, uh, on the way in which our economies work and our societies work or not. Uh, so. Um, there's a health dimension of the security threat that was not perceived so strongly, obviously, just a couple of years ago. And I would say that the number two threat that is now uh, entering also the NATO debate is the climate change related one uh, that in Europe we identified already a few years ago. I remember that already when I was in office, must have been around 2016, 2017, 
we were including climate change among the, um, the, the threat to our security. Uh, and I think that now this is uh, a consolidated common uh, approach that we share in the, in, in, in the alliance. Uh, and I think we, we both share uh, this, this uh, sense of urgency of addressing uh, these two major threats we face uh, together in a coordinated manner and uh, uh, also because we know that there is no other effective way of doing so. Um, and this requires a lot of focus, a lot of work and also a lot of new rethinking about how to shape um, security policies that are not necessarily uh, moving around the traditional um, as I said, military paradigm uh, we are used to work with. And at the same time, uh, keeping uh, a very uh, close eye to the more traditional threats that are still there. Uh, so the level of complexity grows uh, because the old threats are still there as the new threats emerge. Um, and actually we have a layer of, uh, um, of, uh, of uh, challenges and threats uh, that uh, at least from the European perspective are, are very clear. And I would say that here we might have a slightly different um, uh, sense of urgency uh, when it comes to some of the most traditional threats. I think that in Europe um, there is a clear perception now, considering Europe as a whole, uh, of the threat that Russia poses to our continent, uh, also in, uh, uh, in territorial uh, terms. Uh, there is a clear uh, sense of perception of the terrorist threat still uh, and the closeness, uh, the geographical closeness of so many conflicts and crises that are still open and, and still affecting Europe so much uh, in terms both of uh, the, the capacity to produce uh, uh, terrorist attacks or, or to provide the basis for, for terrorist activities that could take place also in Europe. Uh, in this moment, I'm speaking from Brussels, and uh, it's still vivid, the uh, tragic memory of, uh, of terrorist attack here, as it is the tragic memory of 9-11 uh, of in New York, but, uh, and many others, unfortunately. But in, in Europe, I would say we still have this, this perception of, uh, uh, of, of, of the threats that come from the conflict in Syria, uh, in, in Libya, in the Sahel, uh, in, uh, in general, in the destabilization of the, uh, of the neighborhood or the neighbors of the neighbors uh, that we have uh, both to our south and to our east. Uh, and then I would say that, uh, um, indeed, in Europe, there is also uh, a sense of uh, um, exposure to, to, to the new dynamics of, of global politics. Um, now, not to be too long uh, in this first uh, uh, introduction, uh, you asked me to, to, to touch briefly upon also the, the strategic compass, the, the strategic reflection that the European Union is having now on security and defense. Uh, and it is clear uh, that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, starting from, from the assumption that Europe has to take more responsibilities and has to define better its own way of responding to crisis and conflict. Um, because I think we've learned in this last uh, few years uh, that uh, it's always good uh, to count on partners, but you also have to be prepared uh, uh, to, to stand on your own feet if uh, it happens that it, uh, it is required and necessary, hopefully it will not happen again. Uh, but in some cases, and in the recent past, it has happened uh, on, on, on a few occasions. And this can be helpful indeed also in the NATO context because this is a not uh, uh, a new dynamic. Um, it is traditionally referred as the burden sharing. I uh, have to admit I hate the terminology because I think it is not a burden to share, it's a responsibility to share that of security and, uh, uh, and defense uh, in our continent, but also globally. And I think that it's the, absolutely the time for Europe to take uh, its own part of responsibility. And uh, uh, having uh, the strategic reflection on, uh, uh, on security and defense that is ongoing now, and probably this is why uh, the, the, the security directors are, are working in Lisbon these days, uh, the strategic compass uh, exercise is, uh, uh, is very much on top of the priorities of the um, Portuguese presidency. Uh, and uh, I believe that it will be helpful to complement the work that was done in 2016 on the global strategy uh, and uh, give um, uh, a more defined sense of uh, shared analysis, shared interest and, and, uh, and sense of direction as a compass gives in terms of, uh, uh, of priorities to the European Union as a whole. Well, thank you so much for uh, your introductory remarks and I'll hand it over to, to Jim to give his assessment of the same question on the American side. Jim, 
over to you. Well, thank you uh, very much. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think this is a, uh, a a time where, just based on what the high rep just said, in terms of the former high rep just said, in terms of her view of Europe and of the strategic uh, uh, situation there, how it's being looked on, how it's changed over time in terms of China, in terms of Russia. You know, there's a convergence, I think, uh, towards how we see things in Europe and how many European nations are doing that. And so that her talking points and what she said could equally have been what I, what I could say too. And it hasn't always been that way, as we know. Uh, but there does seem to be areas now where you, the United States and the European Union and the EU members are seeing some things the same way. But but let me just start off and say that in terms of the new Biden administration, it's been over. It's been just a little over 100 days uh, since they've been um, in power, and there's been certainly a, a great change in tone uh, uh, compared with the Trump administration. Uh, but I think what we need to do, though, is to go back and look even before the Trump administration at the trajectory uh, that the U.S. relationship with the European Union and the member states there, what that trajectory looked like. Um, and it, was, it wasn't a negative trajectory, but it wasn't one that could have been as uh, at a higher angle, uh, if you will, than it, than, it, than it could have been. I think during the Obama administration, when I served in the Pentagon and uh, as a political appointee, and then as a civil servant uh, during the Clinton days, and uh, and certainly well before then as well, um, we 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 uh, we were slow to take off in terms of our relationship, uh, and uh, and I think uh, just over the past 100 days, I think we can see right now that that our um, that our trajectory and the acceleration can be higher than it's ever been. I think the potential is there. Uh, certainly here in Washington, but what um, Ambassador Mulgrini just said it sounds like in Europe as well. I think we have the potential with the Biden administration to really dig in and try to um, to make this relationship do more in terms of helping our security than we've done in the past. And I say that because uh, first, if you've seen over the past 100 days, the appointment of Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, uh, others in the administration at very senior levels are all very much of the mindset of working with allies and not just NATO allies, but the EU and EU members as well, partners. Uh, that is something I was involved in the campaign and I can tell you that uh, that was certainly something that was discussed quite a bit. And it wasn't because it was seen as anti-Trump. It was just, it was making more and more sense that we had to do more uh, in, in this relationship, we had to do more as an administration to try to find those areas that we could strengthen and that we, we could build on. Um, uh, I, uh, the names I've heard circulating around the rumor mill here in Washington in terms of who might be the ambassador to NATO, the ambassador of the European Union, the OSCE, are all very pro-Europe, very pro-EU, pro-transatlantic names. So I think once those, if they become public and, and if we can see them uh, in fact take office, I think this is, uh, this is going to help us in terms of having decision makers who will push the staffs to put together uh, uh, programs that make sense in this, strategic, um, in this strategic era that we're in. I will tell you in terms of the Biden administration and the president himself, it's no surprise that his priority right now in this first year is going to be domestic. Uh, it's going to be trying to um, pass through a Congress while, while the Democrats control by very slim margins, both the House and the Senate. It's going to be to try to pass historic packages and laws through to help out in a lot of problems in the uh, U.S. domestic scene, not just the pandemic, but racial justice, policing, uh, health care, uh, education, jobs, uh, trying to repair a lot of things that languished as we were caught up in the Cold War or post 9-11. It's time that, that, uh, that, the, uh, that an administration focuses on that. And so certainly while he's got the political leverage, that's where Biden is. But I will tell you, I have been very surprised and, and happy uh, to see uh, Secretary Blinken, I know, was in Denmark yesterday. I think Iceland was going to be his next stop. Greenland. I know when I was working those portfolios, I could never get a cabinet member to go. And now here in the first, uh, within almost 100 days, they're there. And of course, as the ambassador said, uh, we had the president going to Brussels for 
uh, summit meetings, particularly with the European Union, uh, and also the Secretary of Defense was there uh, over the um, past couple of months ago, and Tony Blinken as well, as they talked about Afghanistan. So there's a lot of attention, even though the, the priority is going to be domestic in this year, um, uh, Biden uh, and his people are paying attention to Europe, uh, paying attention to this transatlantic relationship and trying to repair the relationship that was so tarnished and torn uh, by the uh, Trump administration, but also probably didn't get the attention that it needed in the Obama administration, too. Uh, so I think we've got, uh, as uh, President Biden said at the Munich Security Conference, where he appeared on video and gave a very good speech talking about this, I think we have got now an atmosphere, we have people that are going into place that will give us an opportunity to now move forward some projects that make more sense now than they ever have, particularly dealing with China, particularly dealing with Russia, also climate change. I mean, who would have thought three years ago we would be talking climate change with the European Union given the Trump administration? We have that opportunity now. And my only concern is that we come up with the programs uh, and we come up with the uh, initiatives to, to take advantage of this time, that we don't tread water, we don't have lots of meetings, we don't have lots of communiques that don't lock in programs for us to move forward. That's my great concern. Um, we've got the rhetoric coming out of the White House, which is great, uh, but I think we need to start seeing programs. And what I would say to my European counterparts uh, there in the, Europe, in the in the EU, but also in the think tanks there in Brussels and other places, help us do this by coming forward to us with programs too. As you would imagine, the first year of an administration is so much getting people into position, uh, getting staffs ready, going to meetings, listening. There has been a lot of listening uh, with this administration. Um, but I think to jumpstart things, uh, it would be great if we could have coming from the European Union and from NATO in the summits coming up in June, um, ideas that we, we can uh, grab a hold to and begin to negotiate and begin to, to take, take forward. Uh, and that, that's, that would be my plea. Um, you know, when we look at China particularly, I mean, Russia, the, 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 the strategic threat that Russia is presenting to us in Europe um, as tragic as it is to those of us who in the 1990s were hoping for a much better relationship that certainly hasn't arrived, unfortunately. But that relationship with Russia today is a little more familiar in terms of how do you deal with this aggressive Russia that we were seeing. And NATO has, of course, done a lot of things in terms of deterrence and a lot of NATO allies are increasing defense spending. Uh, and just as a side note, that burden sharing, if you will, um, it's going to be something high on the Biden administration uh, agenda too. So just to, as, as you all know, it's a it's a it's a uh, shared it's a shared concern that the United States has. But 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 that aside, I think uh, both the United States as well as NATO as well as NATO members who are increasing defense spending. There's a lot that has been done uh, to deal with Russia, but it's China that's going to be different. The Chinese threat is different. Uh, our relationship with China is different. Ours is different um, compared to the Belgian uh, or the, the UK with China. Uh, and so coming together as a transatlantic community and trying to figure out what we can agree on in terms of how to deal with China, um, that's going to be, that's got to be a high priority. Just convening ourselves to talk about this. I think we have pushed it on the agenda uh, at NATO. But, um, you know, NATO isn't necessarily a place to cover all of these issues that deal with China. A lot of this is within the European Union. It's European members themselves. It's the U.S. itself. We've got to find a place to where we can convene and talk about, as a, as a transatlantic community, talk about what we can do together to deal with this, the rise of China. Uh, and certainly it's, 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 it's much more multifaceted than a military one. Uh, and then you come to Washington, you talk about China, a lot of it is oriented towards the Pacific and a military response. That's, that's only half the picture. And it's not just trade either. We've got other things to, to, uh, to understand and to figure out on how to not just deal with China, but how to work with China. We will be working with China for years to come in terms of trade and that type of thing. And so we've got to sit down as a community and figure out what the priorities should be in terms of what we can do together on this. Uh, and I hope coming out of the EU-US summit, 
uh, in June will be a, 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 will be a, a way in which we can do this, uh, in which we can talk together about that. Um, I, I think that um, the pandemic has shown us too, and climate change, that uh, this idea of transatlantic community and working with allies is absolutely critical. I, I don't hear anyone, even among young conservatives who uh, who uh, are, are still calling themselves Republicans, I don't hear from them the kind of thing I heard from the George W. Bush administration or others where they demeaned NATO, demeaned working with allies, wanted to go it alone. Um, everyone is saying we've got to do this with allies. So I think the pandemic and dealing with climate change show, um, and, and China, these things show that uh, that these kinds of threats have got to be put on the agenda uh, just as much as Russia would be or some other type of military threat, terrorism. They've got to be there and we've got to convene ourselves uh, in such a way that we can prioritize and, and work on, on solutions that we can take forward. My last point is that is, is to just to restate, we have an opportunity now to do this, unlike I've ever seen. And I've worked with the EU since 1990 uh, ESDI uh, days, uh, and um, and I can tell you um, the, the rhetoric that sunk our ability to work together in the early 2000s, that rhetoric is not around anymore. Uh, there is instead a grappling with how do we operationalize this relationship uh, so that we can actually have, have impact on things and what should our priorities be. So I'm hoping that in June, uh, there'll, there'll be a, uh, an awakening of this need to operationalize this relationship uh, and to deal with, a pro with priority problems. Pandemic, China, uh, and uh, the pandemic, China, and uh, climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you also for uh, your words of encouragement to the uh, to Europe and, and, and NATO to <clears throat> reflect as much as possible on uh, poss on uh, on actions and programs, concrete actions and programs, to in order to exploit the great potential that exists today. So that's one. And also on China, I just want to mention that there's already a question I've seen whether um, the Ch China um, within NATO, where the NATO really needs a China policy, but you know that kind of question, in order to survive and to keep uh, uh, the commitment to the transatlantic uh, security alliance, I think, which is a, a fair question um, in, in, um, in uh, let's say, in general terms, uh, but, uh, but probably it's uh, difficult to escape for NATO uh, to complete or to develop a China policy. So, but on the other hand, there is also the question: Do we really need a China policy uh, within NATO in order to uh, to survive as an as an alliance? Now, um, let me turn uh, to Federica Mogherini if she agrees, and ask her a bit about her assessment, uh, a political assessment on all the let's say initiatives she has taken during her time on mainly European security and defense, but also transatlantic ones, and ask the question whether all these new initiatives, which is part of a long trajectory in Europe, of course, whether this time they will make a difference. I mean, I remember they were endorsed by European leaders, thanks to your efforts in 2016. And uh, so you were on the front line and we would be we would love to hear a bit of your experience at that time on all these initiatives um, uh, and your political assessment. Thank you, Federica. Yes, with pleasure. Well, first of all, let me uh, say that I, I share very much the, this opinion that uh, that was mentioned uh, uh, just a minute ago that uh, uh, the, the focus on domestic on on, on Putting things in order in the U.S. Uh, uh, as the first priority for, for the Biden administration uh, is it, not only an American priority, I would say it's also a global priority because I think that um, this is indeed an investment in, uh, uh, in a world order that can, can look like an order and not a disorder uh, in the future. So uh, I think there's full understanding and, uh, uh, and support uh, from allies and partners around the world on the fact that 
this U.S. administration is focusing first and foremost to uh, address some of the challenges and, and shortcomings that the United States have faced in the recent uh, years. So I think that this, for the first time actually, maybe this comes as a part of the foreign policy uh, priority uh, on a global level, and I think this is very wise and, and smart. And for sure, there will be all the support from partners and, and allies on uh, on this uh, on this trend. Coming to uh, yes, to, to the initiatives on European defence that were taken, indeed, as you mentioned, um, uh, they were endorsed uh, uh, by the European uh, uh, Council, so by the heads of state and government in June 2016 in a very, I would say, surreal uh, environment and context because uh, that European Council of June 2016 was uh, the one where the, the global strategy of the European Union was presented that contained a certain number of ideas on how to operationalize uh, the European defense uh, and also the partnership with NATO at the same time, so hand in hand. Uh, but that was the European Council of Brexit because it happened just a few days after the referendum and so i remember very well the sense of panic that all the people who were working with me had in that moment saying should we postpone it should we maybe drop it up completely you know it, it, the word is changing and i think it was actually um uh, the right choice um uh, very contested at the time but i think it was the right choice to to go uh, on with that uh, in that moment because it's exactly in the moment when you uh, you start losing one member that you have to reaffirm somehow a sense of direction or a sense of purpose and unity and i think that helped a lot um uh, so yes i believe that those decisions and those measures those programs that we adopted and then implemented immediately afterwards because the strategy was adopted in in june 2016 and we started working on the implementation of the defense pillar of that uh, already in july 2016 so a few weeks later uh, and we had the first ministerial meeting uh, with the defense ministers and with jens stoltenberg uh, it was in in bratislava in august 2016 so less than a couple of months later, just to start uh, operationalizing all the instruments and measures that were potentially included in that strategy. And just to name them uh, without explaining in details, because I think the audience is familiar with that. The main one was the permanent structure cooperation, the famous PESCO, uh, a mechanism that was included and, and foreseen in the Lisbon Treaty, but was never uh, operationalized, and it allows somehow to use the economy of scale of the European Union uh, to have common projects uh, and, and reduce uh, uh, duplication and uh, an increase uh, uh, in uh, the, the production of capabilities on the European side. Um, that is also useful for NATO. One of the first projects we launched uh, uh, with, with PESCO was actually the military mobility one that was actually suggested by NATO. Uh, and so y there was an interesting um, mix of, of competences because NATO was suggesting a project, the European Union was mobilizing resources and coordinating member states on different pillars of policies because on military mobility you need the military side, but you also need the transport and communication side. So we had the uh, the overall big picture that was allowing us to move forward on a very tricky uh, and practical issue. Uh, and then there were other instruments uh, uh, that were uh, implemented at the same time with the defense package uh, that was then uh, finalized in, uh, in 2017, uh, all by unanimity with the UK already having voted for breakfast. This I want to underline because uh, uh, it was it was an important uh, achievement to me. Uh, it was consensual and it was, uh, I think, instrumental also to strengthen the links with uh, with NATO. So we have these two uh, these two uh, parallel tracks. On one side, um, um, very much in line with what was just said, uh, not really talking about meetings and formats and procedures, but really having an approach of what can we practically do today, tomorrow? What can can we put in place? What projects can work? So uh, you might remember at the time many were discussing and starting or continuing the the discussion that I always found a little bit up in the air about the future of the European army, the future of European integration and defense. My approach was actually the, uh, the contrary. Uh, my approach was to say, okay, what's in the treaties already? What can we do tomorrow? And let's start from there with a very reassuring message towards member states and allies and saying we're simply, it was not sim it was. It was simple, but it was not easy, let's put it in this way. Simply putting in place and in practice the things that we could do already, uh, some of them small and some of them a little bit less small. Uh, and, and to take that pragmatic approach um, and, and 
coordinating the, 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 the review of the budget of the defense budget, for instance, uh, having regular meetings uh, uh, at all levels uh, of the defense ministries, um, uh, having uh, a joint center of command uh, for the training missions that the European Union has uh, in Africa. So small steps that put together created a package that was actually historic because never before so many different tracks of work were activated in practical terms in the European Union on defense. And for the first time with the involvement of the Commission as well, because for me, that was the moment when I realized uh, fully that uh, the fact that the high representative of the Union has actually not two hats, but three, chairs the Council, both in the formation of the foreign ministers and defense ministers, and this was instrumental for me to guide and, and lead this process, but also using my capacity uh, as the vice president of the commission and so coordinating the commissioners and vice presidents that had uh, a portfolio that was linked to, for instance, research industry uh, that was instrumental for um, defense-related industrial and research projects, uh, but also budgets. Uh, and then, um, actually, the High Representative has a third hat, uh, which is uh, being the head of the European Defense Agency that was also, uh, from its side, instrumental to uh, contribute to that process. So, uh, the process was, was started. I still think and believe today uh, that it was uh, um, it was uh, a key moment for the European Union, and it was indeed a game changer. First of all, in terms of uh, um, of, of even psychological approach, uh, realizing that you're speaking about uh, a European defense or uh, a, a union, a defense union, as we were saying then, uh, was. Uh, actually something possible and that leading to something concrete uh, with projects approved and financed. Um, and there was not only no taboo, uh, I, I perfectly remember when I started to discuss this, it was just before I started as a high representative, the first time I mentioned the fact that I wanted to use, I refer to this like this, I said I want to use the full potential of the Lisbon Treaty in security and defense. Uh, I said that in the hearing, in the confirmation hearing in the European Parliament in October 2014 before starting, and all the people around me, all my team said to me, uh, this is a suicide, don't do this because this is going to be a disaster, there's no political will, you will never find consensus, you're losing time, forget it. And instead, I think it, it, it showed that uh, it was not taboo and it was actually useful to meet uh, a need, uh, a need to invest together in defense in, in Europe and to incentivize with the European Union instruments uh, a common approach of member states that were at, at that time and still are uh, largely uh, working in a, in, in, a in a segmented way. Uh, so to reduce fragmentation and to reduce duplication and also to increase interoperability this was absolutely key. Uh, and then I think uh, uh, it, it put in motion some processes that then led to major changes. I, I, I think that afterwards we, we discussed with the, with the Commission um, the, 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 the European Peace Facility or the, the way in which also the Commission started to realize how um, also thanks to, to Juncker that was uh, extremely forthcoming on these issues, how the Commission also can contribute uh, to, uh, to a Europe uh, that is active and, and responsible when it comes to its own defense and security. But for me, what was probably even more important than all of that was the fact that we managed to do this in parallel with a second track of work on defense in Europe that was for me um, really uh, vital and that was the um, the partnership between the European Union and NATO that I would say was never so strong uh, in in the history of the two organizations. Uh, meetings at all levels from um, the top political one between me and, and Stoltenberg but at cabinet level uh, services militaries uh, all, all layers of the two structures uh, we're constantly exchanging and meeting on a regular basis on everything. Stoltenberg was always coming or Rose Gottemeller was always coming to our ministerial meetings. I was always going to the ministerial meetings of NATO. Maybe here it helped a bit the fact that I was previously a minister of a NATO ally, not only a human state. So uh, it was a familiar environment for me. Uh, and this this fact that uh, that also Stoltenberg was always um, uh, advocating for uh, the work we were doing in the European Union on defense, I think 
was a game changer because he realized that this would have made NATO stronger potentially because countries have only one set of forces. And so if member states of the European Union that are largely also NATO allies have more capabilities and better capabilities, that is also beneficial for NATO. Uh, so he got it immediately. He supported the process from the beginning. And we decided together that we would have done this work inside the European Union on defense. But in parallel, we would have uh, strengthened and showcased uh, a stronger partnership between the European Union and NATO. And this parallel track, I think, was essential. One would have not worked without the other. I can say this clearly. Um, and, and I think that today there are good, the good basis for, for this process to continue, provided that member states uh, put uh, some consistency uh, in the implementation of projects. I think this is the uh, the key point because I'm, I'm a practical person. I think that processes are good, but the result of them is more important than the process itself. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, that at the end of the day, we will need to see what kind of practical results will come out of the many different projects that have been uh, launched. Some of them are, I think, on a good track. Some others maybe are dragging a little bit uh, behind. But I think that, uh, uh, yes, in, in, in short, um, if you ask me, was that moment, 2016, 2017, uh, a crossroads, uh, a game changer for the European Union on defense and security, and also for its relations with NATO, but mainly on European defense, I can definitely say, yes, it was, to me, it was the game changer. Um, and um, if you ask me, of all the things I've done in those five years, this is the legacy I'm more proud of. Well, thank you, and rightly so. Thank you so much. Jim, very briefly, if, I, if you allow me, could you say, well, as you've been working in the U.S. administrations, in plural, just to enlighten us a bit, Europeans, how, I mean, what were the real arguments and attitudes in successive administrations, broadly speaking, towards these efforts? Was it encouragement? Was it a bit of fear? Was it fear that the 27 now would not get their act together? What was what was the real uh, what was really going on then uh, regarding the uh, attitude towards all the efforts that uh, former high representative spoke uh, spoke of? Thank you. You have to unmute. Uh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the attitude of the United States, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, would, I would start broadly and say in the United States, there's only a small group of people here in Washington who follow the EU closely enough to understand some of these, uh, some of these uh, groundbreaking initiatives, such as the ambassador just talked about, such as go back to the early 90s, whether it was the beginning of ESDI, it became ESDP, uh, whether it was the creation of PESCO. I mean, you can look at a lot of the things that the European Union tried to do to become more effective as a union. And there were not that many people in Washington who, who were watching it consistently enough to understand how important these things were. <laughs> Uh, and that's a critical point, because here in Washington, as we developed our views towards the European Union, we relied on a handful of people um, who had uh, views shaped by whether it was hubris, uh, that, that uh, you know, that dismissed what the EU did, uh, whether it was by fear, uh, if the European, goes, European Union goes off and does these kinds of things, it's going to be unfair to the United States in terms of trade. It'll be an unlevel, you know, field, the playing field, or it'll be something. I remember back in the early '90s, as uh, as ESDI was being developed, or uh, in the after San Malo, this fear that the Europeans are going to go off on a military adventure and the United States is going to have to go rescue them. Uh, but they're all. But the but the fear too was that um, as the EU developed military capability, was it going to be zero sum with NATO? Uh, and so uh, would we find ourselves, you know, this thing about un no unnecessary duplication, the, the mantra uh, coming out of, of the Washington and, and Brussels, that was founded on this idea that 
uh, if European, the small amount of European spending on defense, if it is increasingly used to do EU things, there's less for NATO, and therefore the, the, this is a zero sum type of arrangement. It weakens NATO, and so so you had, but you had a lot of things that in fact were based on fear, or were based on hubris. Uh, but certainly they were, uh, there was not, I don't believe, there was not an adequate understanding of things that the European Union needed to do and that they didn't necessarily have to be at the expense of either the United States or NATO. But, but, the, but, but, you know, what hurt this understanding between us all was in that time between San Malo and uh, through the George W. Bush administration, the rhetoric between the United States and Europe and certain European capitals was pretty harsh depending on what year you were looking at it, but it was pretty harsh about why the EU needed to do this. It was it was spun, uh, you know, to be seen as counterbalancing the United States. But in Washington, we would hear that, uh, and, and that would provoke a response out of Washington. You had freedom for eyes, if you remember that. So what hurt our ability to, uh, to see each other more clearly and to try to figure out how can we work together you know, with European Union aspirations, how can we work together and be stronger? We were, um, that effort was was uh, undercut by this this rhetoric, which lasted a long time. It lasted through a couple of administrations. Uh, and so, um, so in Washington, um, those people outside the small circle of experts, those people on the on Capitol Hill or perhaps in the administration, in the corporations, particularly defense industries, as they as they would dip in and out of EU uh, initiatives like PESCO or some things like that, they would only see a part of the picture. They wouldn't see the whole thing. And that allowed these misconceptions, misperceptions or vulnerability to harsh rhetoric to to cloud the picture of what we should be able to do. And but the last point I'll, I'll make on that, if this is what you were trying to get at, but the last point I would make on this is, I think we've run through all of that. I think we've got that behind us. Um, I think the, the person who came up with Freedom Fries even apologized uh, right before he passed away. He apologized for coming up with that, which is a great move. So I think on both sides of the Atlantic, we went through a harsh period of, of rhetoric, a harsh period of of um, of twisting things for political reasons, a harsh time of of misunderstanding. I think that's behind us now. I think we are beginning to understand that we can't allow that to cloud how we've got to work together on issues that will only be solved if we work together. Uh, and I think with this administration, you don't hear that coming out of this administration. And the people in this administration were not the ones saying these kinds of things in the past. And I think from Brussels and from other European capitals, we're not hearing the kinds of, of rhetoric, uh, strategic autonomy comes close, but we're not, we're not hearing consistently the kind of rhetoric that would provoke uh, the political culture here in Washington. So, so I think we're in, a, we're in a good place now where we can work together. Is, is that what you were trying to get at in terms of your question? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was very revealing and, and very honest assessment. Thank you so much. And you mentioned capabilities, and uh, I would like to turn to the uh, story behind the development of capabilities in the European Union and in NATO and invite uh, Nick Whitney to give his assessment uh, on the question why Europe has not yet succeeded in developing some missing capabilities, the so-called strategic enablers, and also give his assessment on the buying, the political buying by ministers of defence, the attitudes of chiefs of defence in Europe, I mean these are important people, chiefs of defence, uh, when they're confronted with proposals coming from the defense agency, uh, which you led, or coming from NATO, um, um, when to increase budgets, to develop new capabilities, and so on. Uh, if you want to delve also into questions of, of some of the taboo subjects, such as the uh, European pillar in NATO or division of labor, uh, you're welcome to do so. So, Nick. Uh, I turn it over to you, and thank you for your contribution. Well, Dirk, thank you very much for, for the invitation to take part in this discussion. Um, I bring you greetings from uh, Global Britain. Um, as I'm sure that uh, participants will realize, my country is going through a 
great national renaissance at the moment. Now that we have uh, shaken off the shackles of Europe, um, we are in process, I feel tempted to say, of uh, making Britain great again. Um, nonetheless, I do um, confess to retaining a certain uh, sneaking affection for the European defence enterprise. Um, after all, I, I drank the Kool-Aid in Brussels um, 20 years ago. And I would therefore love to believe and uh, the, the rather upbeat assessment that we've heard from Federico Mogherini about the impact of the slew of defence initiatives that uh, occurred in, in 2016. Um, but I have to say, I do uh, admit to, to harbouring some doubts. Um, I mean, I think the, uh, I don't think we need to worry too much about defence spending in Europe. COVID is obviously going to um, uh, create a lot of problems for, for budgets, but, but fortunately we have passed beyond the, um, the era of fiscal austerity. We're all Keynesians now. And I think defence ministers have enjoyed having increasingly um, extensive budgets to spend in the last half dozen years. Um, there is so much you can do with a defence budget. Quite apart from buying military capability, you can serve the interests of industrial policies and social policies and employment policies. And um, we all do that with our defence budgets, even in the United States. But to my mind, what is important is um, not so much uh, how much the budget is, but how it is spent and the extent to which we spend it on use capabilities. You mentioned strategic enablers, Dirk, um, and I'm not sure we've made a lot of progress with those. Hmm. One of the, um, I don't follow these, uh, the individual progress of, of the slew of projects that were discussed in PESCO and um, so forth with, with great attention these days, but in a sense I don't have to because one of the initiatives of 2016 was, you will recall, CARD, which is the um, stands for the Coordinated Annual Review of Defence, a rather sensible idea to um, take stock every year of how things were going and um, do that on the basis of uh, an intense conversation between different Brussels institutions and the defence ministries of the member states. And the first full card report I see was was published last November. I've been having a look at it, and it's a rather it's a rather striking document. It is an exercise in speaking truth to power, and in some ways it is rather shocking. Um, I mean, some of the some of the key judgments that I pull out of it are, and I'm quoting here, the commitment that's amongst the member states to CSDP missions and operations is very low. And on capabilities, the European defence landscape continues to be fragmented and lack coherence. Card also goes on, this is a report from last autumn, national defence interests and approaches continue to prevail while EU designated priorities are largely ignored. I think this is sobering stuff. On the other hand, the card report also notes that for NATO members, the NATO capability targets seem to serve as their major multilateral orientation. Frankly, I don't, this is not what I would have wished to read. I don't find it surprising. The blunt truth is that the chiefs of defence across Europe, senior military officers, senior figures in defence establishments, have, where they belong to NATO, always preferred the NATO context to do their business in. <coughs> I think um, Federica Mogherini is absolutely right that she made a tremendous difference to the uh, to the nature of the relationship between NATO and the EU. And Jim has also emphasized that so many of the psychological hang-ups of the past decades have now been effectively dissipated to ensure that cooperation between those two organizations can proceed without the um, political obstacles of the past and the misunderstandings. And so my own advice, given where we've got to, or rather 
frankly have not got to on the development of effective capabilities under a European umbrella. And given the preference that remains deeply embedded in most European member states who are also members of NATO, which is the majority, to operate within a NATO context, I say go with the flow. I would like now to see a reversion to the days that Jim referred to in the 1990s, the time when the major effort and the major agenda on the capabilities side was spent on thinking about the development of a European pillar within the NATO alliance. What would that mean? Well, in one sentence, it would mean that the European members of NATO should commit collectively to providing a certain proportion of the total required, assessed required NATO defence capability, let's say half. And work out then between them, with the assistance of NATO staffs, obviously enough, how they would share out that task. Unless you think that's a totally insane idea, I would just mention in passing that the German Defence Minister, Annegret kramp karrenbauer floated an idea very much along those lines last year. The idea that the focus needs to be shifted away from inputs, the amounts of money spent on defence to the outputs, which are essentially, uh, in NATO speak, contributions and capabilities, what we do on operations, and critically, the capabilities that European member states provide for the alliance. So, Jim, you were asking for radical new ideas for actually um, moving things forward at the EU NATO summit. That's mine, and that we embark on a process of considering whether the European pillar of NATO could be reactivated as an idea focused on capabilities and with the idea of a collective European undertaking to provide a certain proportion of what's needed, which would then guide the process of capability development amongst those European nations. Um, time is pressing on. Um, I will just one last final word, if I may. Um, and I would just note that I, I, it seems to me that the prospects for European defence and technological integration are probably rather more encouraging. I mean, true, the latest statistics of the how Europeans have been spending their money in terms of collaboration within Europe, whether on procurement or on research and technology, these latest statistics are frankly dismal. But I'm afraid that the, it seems to me that the problems of serious industrial technological defense cooperation across the Atlantic, the obstacles to those remain pretty much insurmountable, I'm sorry to say, Jim, which is why the, um, we hear so much about the, the talk of, of strategic autonomy in the uh, defense industrial and technological world. And I think the imperative of creating a, a truly European defence, technological and industrial base is now pretty well understood. So if I'm looking for um, a new um, object of optimism to hang my hat on, um, I think I would say it was the European Defence Fund, which may nicely tee up the contribution of Francois Arbeau. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for your wise words and also the transition. And in, uh, indeed, I, I would like to invite uh, Director Arbo from the European Commission <clears throat> to address the question of the, the real significance of this European Defence Fund that has been created, what you would like to achieve, within which time frame, um, how do you see the the discussion or the real involvement um, of, for example, American companies, but also companies from like-minded uh, countries in uh, in the, the projects of the fund or the participation of, uh, of the United States in the so-called PESCO projects. Um, if you could start addressing these questions, and then I suggest that we uh, follow up also with some questions that already are coming from the audience. If that's agreeable to you, uh, I'll give it on, I'll pass it on to you, Director Arbo. Of course, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here and I'm very honoured to be uh, to be with you and sitting also around this virtual table with uh, 
former HRVP and Vice President uh, Federica Mogherini. I think um, rightly so, she insisted on uh, on the defining moment I mean, of 2016, and I think we should not un underestimate uh, this. And I think the EDF is the the last. Uh, I mean, uh, and certainly not the last, but the most recent. Uh, materialization of the uh, the, uh, the new display of ambition that was uh, that was uh, set uh, there back in uh, 2016. Uh, a, a lot of things have been said, which of course I won't repeat, and I think we could discuss for for hours. But I will I will use the idea of for kind of more optimistic transition that was offered by Nick to say that. Indeed, I think we should see it. And again, I mean, I, I can speak from an initial perspective. I don't have any authority to uh, to venture into, you know, uh, uh, EU foreign policy. But from the industrial perspective, I think it's very good news that we have, I mean, the brand new European Defence Fund, uh, you know, voted uh, voted last month and uh, entered into application uh, a few days ago. And now we are very, very actively, and my, my team is actively, you know, discussing with member states on 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 the first uh, work program, uh, hopefully to, uh, to issue the first calls for proposal uh, this, uh, this July. And I think, uh, despite all the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the shortcomings that still exist, I mean, we can be disappointed in a number of things, but I think that there is really a shared understanding that, that the EU must actually act to, to, to equip itself with the requisite capacities that it needs. And I think that uh, clearly, as, as James said, it's certainly not a, a zero-sum game. I think that uh, that uh, the the ambition of the of Europe to 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 again give itself better capacities, you know, um, state-of-the-art capacities, really integrating also the you know the, the the innovation, embracing the digital transformation. All this is very good news because if you, I mean, thinking about it, of course, the the capacities that member states are able to develop. And also thanks to for the incentive uh, given by the EDF, our capabilities that will be actually uh, that will be made available to the EU missions, of course, that can be made uh, you know available uh, to uh, of course to, uh, to 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 NATO, and and actually I think we we have to seize every opportunity to again further equip uh, EU member states in in new capabilities. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the 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 I mean. A, the, the threats are very much changing. Uh, we see that uh, there is really this very strong trend towards the hybridization of threats. I think, I mean, uh, again, uh, beyond the cliche, I think it's more and more difficult to read uh, the, the global situation. Uh, it's a mixture of, you know, hybrid threats, but also necessities to actually uh, speak and, and interact with, with partners. I mean, uh, just to pick an example, and again, I would, be safely back to the industrial perspective. You know, China, for instance, we have to speak with China when it comes to addressing climate change, you know, issues. But but of course, we know that it is more and more difficult to read. The, the threats are changing very fast. We need to actually develop new tools to face new threats. Um, but also, we see that the world is kind of rearming also, so to to a certain extent. So I mean, the threats, also the traditional threats, are never never been as as present as as today. So uh, again, it's very good news that the, uh, the the Europe displays that new ambition. Uh, I think that the EDF has the potential to be a real game changer. Uh, if you compare to what we were in 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 2016, now we have uh, for the next seven years roughly one billion euros to spend on common projects, both on research and uh, development capabilities development. And of course, the point here is to uh, is to ensure the maximum leverage. So uh, again, the, the the EU funding is there to leverage uh, investment uh, at national level as well, and this is what we need to uh, to achieve. And of course, on the uh, the raison d'être of the of the fund, I think we will be judged on two things in the end. We will be judged on our capacity to have a real balanced work program, uh, striking that delicate balance between. The, uh, the demonstration of EU's uh, ability to really come up with the meaningful, you know, uh, capacities, platforms of future that, that we need to build autonomous capacity. And again, autonomous capacity doesn't mean playing, playing it our own way, but really being able to, to be a, a really solid partner and bringing additional capacities to, uh, to, uh, to our like-minded. Uh, so the balance between those meaning, meaningful capabilities, but also uh, investment in re research, you know, and frontier innovation, disruptive research, 
We know the, the keen interest that, for instance, NATO is taking in, into EDT as, as we speak. And of course, the, wh whatever progress we achieve when it comes to disruptive you know, innovation uh, will be, of course, uh, you know, adding to uh, the capacities that member states can contribute to, uh, to, to NATO. Um, so I think, again, this is, this is not a zero-sum game. We are adding uh, uh, capacities, and that's very good news. So we need to strike that, that balance. And we need, and that's even more important, we need to, uh, to create what, what Commissioner Breton uh, described as this affectio societatis. If, if, we have, uh, if we are here to establish, uh, let's say, the EDF uh, in the long run, if we are to, uh, to, uh, to believe that the EDF is here to stay, we have to, uh, to create that tangible experience that every single member state, irrespective of its size, irrespective of the, the specific features of its industrial landscape, is able to make a meaningful contribution to that new determination to again equip ourselves to the, with the capacities that, that we need to be able to, 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 um, to, to face the, 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 the threats that, that, that we are confronted with. And uh, that means that inclusivity, I think, is the key. Uh, if we were in the, in the end of the current multi-annual you know, financial framework, to, uh, to make a finding that, in fact, the, the EDF has only benefited a few, I would say, we, then we will, uh, we will actually have failed. But if we are able to demonstrate that through, uh, you know, the, um, through the gems that exist in every single member state in terms of, you know, uh, small businesses, but which are really, uh, you know, on the top of the art when it comes to, uh, to technologies that, that very much, uh, you know, feed into the, the traditional defense sector. I mean, we know that, uh, you know, the digital transformation, transformation has massive implications for the way we actually conduct operations. Cyber, you know, quantum sensors, uh, you know, semiconductors, uh, secure communication, secure cloud, all this speaks very much to uh, what are the, the, the actual needs uh, in, on the theaters of operations. So, uh, so uh, again, uh, if we are able to demonstrate that each member state is able to actually make that contribution, then we will have created that, that feeling of collective ownership over the ambition to develop a more specific European autonomy that we will then contribute to, uh, to uh, let's say, the, uh, the different you know, uh, alliances that we built to, uh, to, to handle certain, certain situations. So it will be difficult. I think uh, part of the uh, objective is in the process. I think we have to accept this. There will be, you know, um, it's through iterations that we will create uh, that, that, that common culture. Uh, we, I, I see uh, every day, you know, that it's not necessarily, I mean, when it comes, for instance, to the EDF work program, uh, member states need to get together to, uh, you know, to draft together the, the, you know, the technical specifications, the, the, you know, the, the, the core text. And it's not, it's not yet, you know, a, a reflex to pick up the phone and you know to call you know your neighbors and to sit together to to reflect on how how actually to define a common need that we have uh, but by doing so by making sure that we are opening supply chains to all extent possible uh, and actually you see then big primes realizing that in other member states that they would not necessarily have thought of they are discovering you know smes which are really bring a lot of added value to 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 what they want to achieve by doing this, little by little, we will create that kind of collective ownership over an ambition. And, and that's really what we need to, uh, to, to achieve. Uh, it won't be easy. It will take a lot of conf confrontations of natural reflexes, cultures, but innovation will also result from that confrontation of cultures. You know? uh, that's a way to actually uh, you know, uh, uh, really um, incentivize you know, uh, researchers, you know, uh, planners to think a bit out of the box. So, uh, so again, it will. Uh, uh, it, it's an experiment that we are conducting uh, in real time, but uh, we are very hopeful. I mean, notwithstanding uh, all the difficulties that we know of, that uh, that little by little we will create uh, again that affectio societatis that is uh, very much needed in Europe uh, to achieve actually the um, the ambition that was already a signal in the uh, in the global strategy that uh, Mrs. Mogherini actually put forward back in 2016. And now we start harvesting, I would say, the fruits. But of course, uh, let's hope that the, 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 the best is, uh, is still to come. And we have a number of years to uh, use the proof that, uh, that all this made sense and actually can produce tangible results. Well, thank you so much, uh, Director Arbo. Merci beaucoup. Um, uh, I suggest that I follow up um, on your intervention um, 
with uh, questions. I have many questions. I, I, I had to group them and uh, I open I open the Q&A now. But uh, Director Arbo, there was one question from the, um, uh, the chairman of the NATO Industrial uh, Advisory Group who is in the audience, but it's one of his uh, many hats. His name is Colonel Rudy Prim. And his, his question runs as follows. Though, given the fact that we all know this, that uh, successive NATO and EU <coughs> communiques have stressed the need to promote transatlantic industrial cooperation and transatlantic research and development, could we do a reality check and ask ourselves whether defense companies across the Atlantic, let's say, uh, including, of course, uh, the British, um, can they really work together uh, without uh, impediments when it comes to regulation, when it comes to, let's say, the reflex of uh, national uh, and different standards, the so-called Buy American Act, the strategic autonomy reflections in Europe. In other words, does this sector need, or maybe even deserve, sufficient waivers from all these, let's say, potential impediments in order to reach the objectives you've been talking about, the, I mean, the ambition, to realize the ambition uh, of all these new instruments. Um, a sub-question coming in from a, a friend from the University of uh, in Prague in uh, Czechia is whether, but in fact, it's the same question, whether the fact that on, on the one hand, we have some trade tensions between the US and the EU, on the other hand, uh, with, in, with PESCO and uh, European Defence Fund, we're trying to increase competitiveness, of course. Uh, is there a risk of a rift? But I think that's a, that's a sub-question of that main question. So I launch a big one. I'm sorry for that, but we'll be glad to hear your reflections uh, on uh, uh, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there have been indeed. I mean, as we were finalizing the, the negotiation, as you know, of the uh, of the EDF. There have been uh, a number of, you know, misunderstandings and fears which uh, which had to be alleviated. And I think it's very important to insist here again, uh, and and we did that in many occasions, that that EDF is certainly not a protectionist program. You know, uh, it is, of course, it is a fund where 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 big sums of money from the EU are investing in 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 projects and in industrial cooperation projects in support of you know the, the strategic autonomy in the sense that we need to develop the, the, the capabilities that help us basically being really uh, you know heavyweight in in uh, in uh, in uh, let's say uh, goals that we pursue with the like minded but uh, but to be to be a credible and and uh, you know important partner you have to be uh, able to have some some freedom of action which means that that you have to be uh, 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 you, you have to avoid uh, really uh, having big dependencies, you know, which which really constrain your capability to deploy certain uh, certain capabilities in whatever circumstances. So I think it's only legitimate that that there is a concern and that there are rules which make which uh, which uh, aim at, for instance, making sure that whatever is deployed under the fund and with EU funding is actually, you know. Free from certain restrictions, which which might be, be be imposed, of course, by virtue of the contribution of a, a given, uh, you know, um, partner in a consortium. And I think this is this is very legitimate. This being said, I think we see from the precursors, and I think it will be further uh, adduced as, as as proof by by the EDF that that you know. Uh, Third country, uh, well, entities which are uh, owned by third uh, countries can actually participate in the uh, in the EDF, but on the on the condition that again that the, the fruits of the, the the joint development does not mean that that uh, that uh, there are uh, there are limitations to do to the use that can be made out of the capabilities that will be developed. And I think that uh, I think that's fully understandable by 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 our partners and by by the like-minded. But again, I think we have to reason in terms of concrete projects. I mean, the again, I, I want to enter to indulge into cliche, but I think here we are uh, 
we are into uh, that ambition of creating those, those solidarities between the member states on specific projects which are really uh, responding uh, concrete needs you know in the light of what we we, what we read in terms of threats of the strategic compass, the capability needs that we will identify in the light of the threat analysis that is being uh, being uh, basically uh, carried out. Um, and once we we are clear as to what exactly our needs are, then we have to you know to to bring together a number of you know willing partners to develop uh, those uh, those new tools. And I think um, whatever we actually manage to uh, to uh, to to uh, to create in terms of meaningful state of the art innovative capabilities will uh, will serve the, the collective interests of all the like minded that we have of course in in mind so uh, uh, again we navigate a very complex environment uh, there are a number of different interests i mean you mentioned also trade interests I mean, of course this is a, this is a delicate balance between competition but also alliances in, in at, at many different levels but mindful of all these constraints, I think we can, there is room for further, more intense uh, EU cooperation that will actually uh, contribute more to the, to the global alliance, uh, you know, of those serving the interests of democracy and pluralism uh, in the world. Oh, sorry. Follow-up question to Jim. By American Act, will we get a waiver for defense? in Congress, when, uh, is that possible? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I'm looking with because uh, Nick knows all of the problems that come with uh, what we're talking about here, age-old problems, whether it's Buy America, whether it's tech transfer, uh, third country uh, sales. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, of uh, nicknames that that those who work in transatlantic uh, defense trade know, uh, because these are age old and we run into this. And um, and I think uh, you know you can allow yourself to get so depressed by the obstacles that you just say, well, let's just walk away. We just can't do this. That would be wrong. Uh, I I would what I would say directly to your point is there are waivers out there. Um, and there's ways to there's ways to to deal with these problems if we try. Um, mm. You know, I, I I think in some ways, uh, Buy America doesn't bother me as much as third country transfer bothers me. And I mm. and I think uh, Mr. Arbo mentioned I think he was getting at that where if U.S. content is in a EU manufactured a PESCO project, then the then the U.S. gets to call the shots about where it goes. I mean, you know, that kind of thing is we we just we we're gonna have to deal with that, um, and and I think we we can't sit back and say these are insurmountable. There are problems with transatlantic defense trade. There are problems uh, with uh, third party participation in PESCO issues. I mean, we know that, but that but that shouldn't stop us from trying to deal with them. Um, you know, we have military mobility now as a PESCO project. The the ambassador mentioned that. Um, these concrete projects, when we're confronted with these obstacles, give us an opportunity to try and try to find a workaround, whether it's a waiver of some type, whether it's a way in which we can deal with U.S. export controls or technology transfer uh, issues or something within the European too. Uh, where it's just going to take time to work through these things. And I think that kind of takes me a little bit. I think maybe Nick might have been um, referring to this a little bit early on, but but you know, PESCO projects and other other things within the European Union that can help the Union become stronger. Um, you know, uh, it's going to take time. It's going to take a long time. Look how much time it's taken since since San, Mar uh, uh, San Malo and the first stirrings of a European military capability within the European Union headquarters in Brussels. I went to those early meetings and and it was you know starting from scratch look how far things have come uh which are impressive in a lot of ways but in a lot of ways too it shows how long it can take and so when it comes to procurement uh within the european union or transatlantic with third country partners um it's going to take even longer because we all have these national rules 
but um, but the promise that can come from working together makes it worthwhile trying to deal with them, to trying to deal with these problems, whether it's third country participation in PESCO or whether it's US tech transfer controls. Uh, uh, there are workarounds. We just need these 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 uh, specific concrete projects like military mobility to help be the uh, the 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 warhead, if you will, to, to, or the battering ram to knock us through some of these and to come up with ways uh, where we can overcome these obstacles for the future. We just have to keep working at it. We have to keep chipping away. Thank you, thank you, Jim. I have um, a couple of questions uh, for Federica Noverini from the audience. Um, if the uh, director is still there, um, uh, there are a couple of questions. I am. Uh, on space. I am, I am. I don't know why they're directed to you, but everything that is space related seems to be directed to you. Uh, but there's also another, another question. So EPIC 2, um, the first um, director is that um, question is about given the um, strategic cooperation between the United States and Europe on space. Is there anything, let's say, um, new, useful, courageous that the EU can offer uh, given the new potential in the relationship on <coughs> space security and in particular EU space security? This is a question from a research, an Italian research student uh, at the University of, uh, of Leuven, Giulia Pavesi. Uh, the second question is um, whether you have given uh, some thought to the idea of a European pillar in NATO, and in particular, how that, could that work in practice if one would go through with such an idea, which is still very much contentious today. So these are the two questions addressed to you. Can I add one to Jim? <coughs> in order to accelerate. Um, Jim, there is a question from um, a colleague um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark, who's asking whether uh, you could say something about uh, the uh, arms control as a subject matter for cooperation between the United States and the European Union, given the fact that the current regimes are more or less on life support, or almost on life support. Um, <clears throat> And a second, uh, Jim, if I may, but also please, Nick Whitney, please come in on that one. Um, any thoughts on ongoing thinking in Washington or for that matter in London um, or elsewhere on military readiness um, and, uh, and the whole issue of our military readiness, especially within NATO, I would say, uh, with the possible consequence that um, reliance on the nuclear umbrella might uh, increase. Uh, well, that's only one possible consequence. And that's a question that came from a senior research fellow at Egmont Institute, uh, Mr. Matelar. So um, if that's okay, can we start with, uh, with Director Mogherini? Uh, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And uh, I will have to uh, I will have to apologize, but uh, uh, I have uh, uh, another uh, commitment uh, starting in a few minutes, so I will uh, 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 try to uh, be brief, and uh, uh, and then unfortunately we'll have to leave you, um, as uh, as I think we're um, we're um, yes getting close to 7:30 European time, so I'm sorry for that, but. Uh, um, I found out that the life of a rector is not less challenging agenda-wise than the one of the high representative, uh, but this is for another conversation. Uh, I think that uh, on, on space there is, I think, a lot of potential to, um, to, to cooperate more than to compete, for sure, uh, and, and we see how much uh, of, uh, of a strategic uh, uh, interest uh, others are putting in that, starting from China, and I think that indeed uh, it's extremely important uh, uh, that uh, we find ways to uh, increase cooperation in that sphere um, across the Atlantic and also between the European Union and NATO if possible, because uh, we've done so in uh, uh, in so many different strategic domains, uh, some of them uh, considered new or frontier ones, so I think of cyber, I think of hybrid, I think of strategic communications, and I think space is the other frontier that is out there, the most obvious one, and I think that indeed uh, this should be 
um, one of the key priorities and attention. On, on the European pillar of NATO, I'm afraid that uh, we would need a separate conversation of a couple of hours because indeed uh, uh, the complexity and also the, the different options that are there and also the, um, the, the future projections of that is, uh, is quite a, a challenging one. So I, uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable in addressing this in a couple of minutes at the end of this conversation. But if I may, um, before I, I'm sorry I leave you, but um, I would like to underline uh, two points that I think were coming up of the conversation and that I share very much and I want to really stress, uh, um, if I may. One is the fact that uh, obviously NATO allies committed to 2% of GDP uh, investment on defense. Um, I think that also words here are important and I think it's important to say investment and not spending uh, to take care of our public opinions and explain uh, what is this about. But I perfectly agree with what was said that uh, it's not so much the spending, it's the output of the investment. Uh, it's not the amount of money that is so relevant, but is on what, uh, on, on which output uh, this this uh, um, this percentage of the GDP is is invested. Because you can have um, uh, a defence budget that is. Uh, almost exclusively focused on salaries and pensions uh, and, and no capabilities or no operations and you do very little with that. Well, you do a lot with that. You do, uh, you do basically social security, but uh, this is not indeed the strategic interest of the allies uh, or, or, or of the European Union for it counts. So I think that really uh, it would be interesting to shift from, uh, uh, from the quantity uh, to, to, to the quality of the output uh, and the sectors in which we decide to invest. And this is exactly the kind of exercise that that CARS was trying to incentivize. And it takes time, I think, it takes time. The other point I would like to, to stress is this. Indeed, it takes time for this uh, mechanism, these projects even to, 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 um, to, 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 to become real. Uh, it, it takes an enormous amount of time to build capabilities, uh, and it takes even more time to build capabilities in a joint manner, overcoming uh, what we called uh, with Stoltenberg uh, uh, in those years, 2016, 2017, the ghost of the past. There's so much of dust uh, on top of this, some, of some of these taboos uh, that, uh, that it takes time. It takes time technically, it takes time industrially, it takes time in terms of research and project developments, but it also takes time to, to, to deliver. And so we're talking here about uh, processes that were launched three, four years ago. And I think that really we, uh, we deserve to let them run a little bit longer before we assess them in terms of concrete outcome. And last, last, last but not least, I don't deny, I think there are issues. I perfectly agree. There are problems to be tackled. There are complicated problems to be solved and addressed. Uh, but I think that if there are issues of that kind are indeed on the level of the industrial uh, production and on, uh, um, uh, on, on not on the strategic uh, vision. And uh, what made me suffer the most uh, uh, when, when looking at some of the reactions uh, also across the Atlantic on, on the work on the European defense was sometimes um, the, uh, the, 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 the temptation that some interlocutors had to hide behind um, uh, strategic thinking um, uh, discussions uh, what was actually a legitimate and real uh, economic uh, divergence of interest that we have to address, I think, uh, for what it is. It is a matter for, uh, for the industry uh, across the Atlantic and not only across the Atlantic, with the UK as well and others. It is an issue uh, that needs to find practical, pragmatic, and constructive solutions. But what uh, we do not deserve having is a debate about uh, the fact that uh, building European defense uh, is uh, um, drifting us apart uh, strategically and politically and in terms of alliance, which is not true and I think will never be true. Uh, and call names, uh, call things for, for with their names. Uh, if there are issues on, on the industrial and trade uh, level, let's address them for what they are, not strategic issues, but industrial issues. Uh, again, I, I'm sorry I will have to leave you now, but I thank you for uh, a, a terrific debate and I'm looking forward to keep in touch and continue the conversation hopefully another time. And uh, again, I apologize, but uh, um, I, I have another commitment coming up in a few minutes. Peter, thank you so much for your precious time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jim, can we, if you still remember the questions I asked, and then I will pass it to Nick because Nick is asking the floor. Yeah. Um, I'll go real fast, Nick. Uh, just a couple things. One is I want to clarify on zero sum with uh, 
Ambassador Arbo. Uh, you know, my um, uh, what I was trying to say is that was one of the fears back in the 90s, particularly, was that there that would be a zero sum. And I think that there's, you know, there's some legitimacy still to it. But we have we are, but I think you can see your way to seeing that that's not as much a fear today as it as it was back then, because we're more cautious. I think we're aware of that. Secondly, Nick, I agree with you about your uh, that that idea of Europe uh, doing 50 percent, the U.S. doing 50 percent. And that idea I've heard kicking around Washington, too. So who knows? It might have some legs, but I think it's an interesting way to, to look at it on arms control. Uh, and again, you, we could talk for hours, but but arms control, this this administration has come in uh, with a very uh, robust view of arms control and the role of arms control. As you know, one of the first things they did was to extend uh, the new start and uh, and already there's there's talking about okay how where do we go from here on arms control? We know that um, uh, the INF agreement has been was breached and is now no longer in existence, but that doesn't mean the problem has has not gone away uh, in terms of what breached it. It's the those Russian cruise missiles, uh, and it's something that uh, we're going to have to deal with. And it could be that um, arms control is one way to try to bring about strategic stability. Uh, and in terms of the role in the European Union in this, um, I, th I think I think really uh, in terms of arms control and sitting down and doing conventional arms control, uh, that's something that the US and perhaps some other European nations, if we're talking about the nuclear side of it, uh, you know, uh, maybe UK and France, who knows, but uh, certainly the US and Russia have to deal with that. We need to bring China into it as well. This is gonna, it takes a long time to do it. I think this administration wants to begin discussing um, aspects of the strategic uh, part of arms control. And I think in terms of the European Union, those kinds of discussions usually happen at the uh, national level. Uh, NATO gets involved. NATO is briefed by the United States. NATO has its own arms control um, agenda, if you will, or an arms control perspective. Uh, uh, the, I'm sure listening right now in the audience are people who work on that at NATO. So, so a lot of what is done is keeping allies involved, in, uh, in, uh, keeping allies included in the conversation on where arms control is going, what next steps are. In terms of the European Union, I, I, I certainly think the EU has got to be a uh, in that in that dialogue too. But traditionally, it's been through NATO. Uh, and um, and uh, because NATO EU membership are virtually the same, I think that's how a lot of that communication is done. But I think the EU uh, getting briefings and, and having a, a keen interest and an expertise is important, particularly now. It's different. The EU is different today than when arms control negotiations began years ago. So I think there could be a role. And so I think we should definitely think about that in terms of readiness. Um, readiness is still a problem. Um, and again, looking at Nick, I mean, Nick, as I remember, Nick, you worked NATO as well. I think that's where we first met. And so uh, readiness has always been a problem. Uh, readiness has gotten better, certainly since uh, the battle groups went into the Baltics and into Poland. Uh, there have been readiness initiatives uh, ongoing, uh, and they, they're launched every year. Um, readiness is a key part of deterrence. If you don't have readiness, you don't have much deterrence. Uh, and when you don't have deterrence, you leave yourself open to, uh, to coercion, uh, including nuclear coercion. I think it's where your questioner was coming at it from a nuclear perspective. Uh, so in terms of readiness, in terms of NATO readiness, in terms of what each individual ally needs to be able to do at a moment's notice, that's probably one of the most critical missions for NATO and where we still have problems. I will say we've got a better story to tell today than back in uh, in 2014, but I but I can tell you this will be on the administration's agenda when they meet in June. Is what what more can we be doing, particularly in terms of decision making uh, within the NAC uh, among nations uh, to allow SACUR to take certain actions? Uh, you know that's been around for a long time as in terms of a problem, uh, and that'll be certainly taken up, I'm sure, by this administration as well. But the bottom line for your questioner is that uh, in terms of that that nuclear aspect, that that uh, I, I think nuclear coercion perhaps is where he was coming from. Uh, I don't know, but um, but we've got to do everything we can, including nuclear sharing, uh, including that that extended deterrence, that nuclear relationship that the U.S. has with NATO. Uh, this is something that is part of uh, deterrence and something that will 
along with improving readiness, will keep nuclear coercion or keep certainly at bay um, uh, uh, a, a uh, fallback on a nuclear response, uh, which is something no one wants. Uh, so uh, if, if that gets to those questions. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh... <clears throat> So Nick, you wanted to intervene, and now we're going to wrap up uh, this uh, this session. Um, I I did, Dirk, and thanks for giving me the floor. Um, my problem is that I too have a unusually uh, in these days of leisure and semi-retirement, I have another Zoom call that I'm late to go on to. Um, but you referenced readiness to me, and I just want to say two things. One that I entirely agree with Jim that this is, you know, the the hollowing out of forces is no way to um, achieve and maintain deterrence and readiness is, is a vital aspect of, uh, of having effective capabilities. Um, the other observation I wanted to make is that um, it's not much use having uh, ships tied up alongside or um, regiments sitting in barracks. We're living in an increasingly dynamic and contested world. Um, China, shorthand. Um, but many other um, many other dimensions to the move to the the age of international competition into which we're moving, and military assets are assets which should be sweated and used and moved around and deployed and made visible. Um, and I think there's uh, something important for us there. Um, and with that, I will just repeat that I'm extremely grateful to have um, been allowed to participate in this conversation. And um, I'm sorry to say I must. Uh, did you adieu? Well, thank you so much. Thank you all of you. Uh, and um, I, I would like to, um, to thank the panelists for their precious time, for their contribution and their insights. And uh, <clears throat> I thank the audience for the many, many questions. Um, um, I hope that everybody had some new insights from this conversation. What I certainly will remember is this, uh, the, the fact that uh, in this conversation, there was this uh, idea that uh, there is an important window of opportunity. It may be short, maybe not, but it may be short. But probably we still need on both sides to uh, work a bit harder on a more focused agenda of real programs and actions. And that's certainly a takeaway uh, for me and I hope also for the audience. So um, I hope that uh, the audience remains uh, interested in the activities of America Europe Fund at the KU Love University and the Center for Global Governance. Uh, I can announce, if I may, uh, our next lecture, which will be on innovation, innovation policy in the United States, in Europe and China, obviously. Uh, and that will take place on the 25th of May. And then on the 20, 22nd of June, we will have a closing lecture on Russia. So once again, thank you all of, thank all of you and uh, I wish you a very pleasant afternoon in Washington and an excellent evening in Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.